It is a new day here in sunny San Diego and this year's Biophysical Society meeting is off in full swing. Hi, I'm Lamore Abrams, host of BPS TV. We've got another great show for you, so let's dive right in. Today we'll catch a glimpse of Bill Clemens' Blacken Biophysics Symposium, then we'll sit down with BPS President-elect TJ Ha. We'll take a closer look at Lumix and Thermo Fisher scientific booths in the exhibit hall, and then we'll talk to Jeffrey Chow about the life and death of mRNAs. Plus, we'll continue our tour of top research institutes from all across the globe. But first, let's find out what you won't want to miss on today's conference schedule. The Future of Biophysics Burroughs Welcome Fund Symposium is one of the highlights of the annual meeting. This symposium showcases the state-of-the-art research of four outstanding early career biophysicists selected from a pool of more than 25 nominees. The 2023 presenters reflect astonishing creativity and diversity of the next generation of biophysicists. We are used to thinking of ion channels and transporters as distinct units in the cellular membrane. But it turns out that in many cases, they interact with one another to form macromolecular complexes. The symposium on unholy matrimony of channels and transporters will feature some of the emerging examples of how channels and transporters work together to bring about unique physiological functions. Toxic work environments where bullying, harassment, and bad behavior are allowed to persist create unsafe environments for staff and students. Unchecked, this can lead to physical and mental health safety issues, underperformance, and ultimately contributes to highly talented people leaving science. The Symposium on Opportunities for Change, Setting Standards to Address Harassment in Science will be a forum where leaders from national funding agencies and diversity and inclusion accreditation bodies will discuss their roles in driving institutional culture change and creating an inclusive scientific climate. Finally, we'll have a symposium on artificial enzymes, protein dynamics and directed evolution that will highlight innovative research in the field of protein design and directed evolution, aimed at optimizing and enhancing the activities of key biological enzymes. Biophysics Week is an annual event that celebrates biophysics' impact on science and society. It works to engage uh, young students and encourage them to pursue careers in biophysics, as well as foster networking and uh, collaboration between uh, researchers. What my student chapter we are planning, we are actually planning a couple of activities that week. We are trying to find a primary undergraduate institution. We're going to go there and talk about biophysics and we're going to get a few of our members to form a student panel. And we're going to have professional development event. So we're going to invite two speakers in computational biophysics. And they're going to come talk to our students about what they do and then the last event is going to be a community outreach where we're going to go to a local middle and high school student and kind of talk to them about biophysics. This spring we have our big event, the Biophysics Annual Colloquium. It's going to be our third edition. We'll have student talks, poster presentations, and a keynote lecture by Professor Eva Nogales from UC Berkeley. So we are really looking forward to that. The most exciting thing would be, uh, I would say, engaging with the students, you know, peers and, and younger students as well, as well as learning about cutting edge research that is going on. Taste and smell have long been the most understudied of our primary senses. But when coronavirus hit, worldwide loss of taste and smell made understanding these senses a priority. Now the Monell Chemical Senses Center, a nonprofit research center focused on studying taste and smell, is using that momentum to drive big changes in public health. The mission of the Monell Chemical Senses Center is to understand how the senses of taste and smell work and to use this knowledge to improve public health. One really new and exciting discovery and development coming out of Monell is 
a rapid smell test called Sentinel. And this test was developed during COVID when people started to realize they were suddenly losing their sense of smell. At this point, the test has been licensed by a startup company that is taking it to commercial application. And our goal really is that everybody will get their smell tested the same way you get your hearing tested when you're very young. And when you go to your doctor for your annual checkup, you'll get your smell tested. Now let's head to Beijing with more than 17 laboratories and over 40 postdoctoral fellows on its staff. The Beijing Frontier Research Center for Biological Structure is aiming for significant breakthroughs in the field of structural biology. The center is dedicated to elucidation of important biological structures that help decipher the secrets of life. These structures include those of proteins, nucleic acids, complexes, organelles, cells, even tissues and organs, basically at all levels. Seeing is believing. We are hoping to cultivate an environment to encourage scientists from different disciplines uh, to uh, work together. We try to build a center with a world-class discipline on all different uh, aspects of uh, our life. It is a very exciting time for structural biology. New tools, new technologies are emerging to facilitate deciphering of additional structures and complexes. Black in Biophysics was created specifically to address the issue that one of the most profound disparities that we see is its representation for black and African Americans in STEM broadly. But especially here at the Biophysical Society, this is something that is a goal for us to address. The most important thing, in my opinion, about enhancing diversity in any institution is to first notice where there are disparities and then also to address the fact that, you know, where do you have the power to be able to have impact on it? You can't do everything, and not everyone can be great at this, but everyone can do something. And so taking the time to just give a little bit of your time, a little bit of your resources to help elevate and change the conversation. The Biophysical Society has a very broad reach. With over 5,000 members and a large annual meeting every year, it's a great way to actually get people engaged and involved in the scientific process. I love being a biophysicist, and I think there's lots of people like me out there who would love being biophysicists too. And so by taking the time as a society to actually reach out and encourage people to come and be part of this discipline will not only enrich our discipline, but actually create new levels of innovation. We're here now with TJ Ha, BPS President-Elect. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me here. And I'd like to know what inspired you to seek out the role of BPS President? That's a good question. Uh, I wanted to repay my debt to the society. I'm a physicist by training, and everything I know about biophysics, it's fair to say that I almost everything, uh, learn everything from uh, the society. So we have the most exciting poster sessions of any society I know. I can learn so much from a five minute conversation with somebody I run into uh, in the poster session. And these kind of interactions are very difficult to replicate digitally. So I believe that the future of the society and biophysics in general will depend on our ability to put together an exciting and forward looking program for the annual meetings. So I really wanted to uh, help uh, maintain and grow our society uh, through uh, uh, exciting annual meeting programs. Absolutely. Nothing like face-to-face -face interactions. Correct. What are some of your goals for BPS in the year ahead? There are three uh, major areas that I want to focus on. In fact, exactly following the priorities of the society. First, uh, diversity. Second, uh, uh, global reach. And third, public uh, outreach. Uh, through the pandemic, we learned uh, that talent is everywhere and uh, disease has no borders. And we also learned that effective communication to the public is critical in gaining uh, their confidence. 
Excellent. Why should members want to get involved with BPS leadership? Well, BPS is great because of the members. We uh, uh, learn uh, again through the pandemic uh, that a quantitative and careful measurements and methods uh, can make a huge difference in our lives and also generally in improving the human conditions. And as uh, at a leadership member, uh, you can uh, help all our members uh, to reach their full potential and to become the heroes of their own uh, research and scientific endeavors. Thank you so much, TJ, for speaking with us and best of luck in your upcoming tenure as BPS president. And now let's head over to the exhibit hall. That's where Thermo Fisher Scientific is showing their impressive array of cryo EM microscopes. So we have really three main tools that we're, we're featuring today for, for cryo-electron microscopy. That's the Tundra, which is our entry-level tool for, we, we sort of position for, for new users and, and people just getting started in cryo-EM, or uh, users that just need an easy-to-use platform for doing their experiments. We have the new Glaciers 2, which I'll come back to in a, in a second, which is sort of our mid-range uh, cryo -tem. And then we have our high-end instrument, the Cryos. Uh, and so that Cryos is basically the workhorse of cryo-EM. Uh, it can do tomography, it can do micro ED, it can do uh, single particle analysis. Uh, and really just, uh, you know, these beautiful structures that you see here are done either on the glaciers, the cryos, or the tundra. Uh, all three tools just are enabling structural biology for our, for our customers and our users and for drug discovery. So the Glaciers 2 is our, our newest uh, platform for cryo-electron microscopy and, and really can enable all three workflows or th all three main workflows, micro, uh, micro ED, single particle analysis and tomography. And really the Glaciers 2 is, is built around ease of use and so a number of features around the, uh, around the tool enable just non-expert microscopists to use the tool and I think one of the big things that we, we added to the Glaciers 2 is a software component uh, with Smart EPU and, and really that just uh, enables users of all skill levels to start acquiring really, really high quality data with, with minimal experience. BPS for me has always been the why, right? It's just the biology questions that people are approaching and asking. And I think that's where the amazing science is happening. And so you get to talk to people about their problems, about their projects, about their work, and, and really think about how we at Thermo Fisher can actually help them. and and enable structural biology for, for, the, for the, you know, the protein biochemists and the biophysicists, and that's everybody that's in this room. And so, I don't want to give a percentage, but I'm sure there's a significant percentage of people here that are not doing structural biology, but structural biology would greatly enable the research that they're doing. And so for us, it's, it's how do we approach those people? How do we talk to those people? And how do we just explain the benefits of having a picture? Now let's head over to France, where we will learn about EMBL Grenoble. We'll find out about their work in structural and molecular biology of protein RNA complexes involved in gene expression and host pathogen interactions. The European Molecular Biology Laboratory is an international world-leading molecular life science institution which has several different sites across Europe. EMBL Grenoble is situated in France, where we are doing research in uh, structural biology, development of instrumentation for research in structural biology, and we also provide services to user community. We are part of European Photon and Neutron Science Campus, which is composed of French Institution for Structural Biology, European Synchrotron Radiation Source, and Institute of Laue Langevin, which is the neutron source, putting us on the campus together with two most brilliant synchrotron and neutron sources on the planet Earth. This puts us in an excellent position to do cutting-edge structural biology research using complementary facilities and possibilities that this environment offers. Molecular Horizons at the University of Wollongong in Australia is a leader in visualizing biological processes, helping to develop greater understanding of health disorders and translating this knowledge into diagnostics, therapies and cures. Well, the University of Wollongong is uniquely placed because not only do we have 
fabulous basic science and translational science facilities. We're also a training facility for a whole range of health professionals. We're a perfect environment to not just generate new ideas, but test them in the laboratory and also make sure that these ideas are taken to market. The visualisation capabilities and capacities of Molecular Horizon are leading edge. They allow very complex interactions to be visualised in spatial and temporal time, allowing us to develop real-life solutions in real time. There is so much potential in terms of where visualization can go. What we're working towards now is to actually look at all these different protein molecules, but actually in the context of their cellular environment. And we're here now with Jeff Chow. He's over at the FMI in Switzerland. Thank you so much for joining us, Jeff. No, thanks for having me. Your work involves imaging mRNA molecules in living cells. What insights have you gained about how these cells are regulated? Yeah, so it's been really exciting. I think for the first time, we've been able to go beyond just being able to see the molecules inside cells. I mean, that's also just exciting by itself. You can watch individual molecules of RNA moving around inside cells. But now, we've developed tools that you can really ask questions about what's going on in their lives. So not just, you know, looking at them, be able to see what they're doing and figuring out how they're being regulated. And so. Two key aspects in RNA's life are, you know, when they translate, when they make proteins, and also when they decide that it's time to stop making proteins and degrade. And so we, my group's really been interested in trying to develop tools that allow us to pinpoint these moments in their lives and be able to ask, you know, when, how much, uh, you know, protein did they make? When did they decide, okay, now it's time to degrade, we don't need the RNA anymore. And so really, there's been lots of surprises here. Um, when we were looking at stress, so uh, when cells get stressed, they form these compartments inside the cell called stress granules. And for a long time, people thought that RNAs that were inside these compartments were completely translationally repressed. And because we really only had measures that allow us to look at the ensemble of RNAs inside the cell, and usually you had to lyse cells and then infer what they were actually doing inside the cell. And so with the tools we have now, we could go in there and look at the individual molecules of RNA and what we could find is that actually these stress granules, despite the fact that you know, the, the dogma in the field is that this was a, a compartment that was translationally pressed, we could see that the RNA is translated there just fine. And so I think that just sort of highlights the sort of the questions that you can address now with these sort of tools. And so I think it's an exciting time. What techniques do you use to study this? Yeah, so we actually use fluorescent microscopy. And so we develop tags that we can put on these individual molecules and follow them around. And then, like I said, we try to do more than just observe them, and so we develop tools that allow us to look when they degrade. So we set up a system that the RNA is labeled in two colors, and essentially when one of the colors disappears, we know when the RNA gets degraded. And so we've been playing games like this to understand how RNAs are regulated. Interesting. We have a video from you demonstrating this. Can you explain what's happening here? Sure. So in this video, what you see is a dual-colored RNA molecule. You'll see it in, in magenta and green, and you see it sort of diffusing around. And then there's a moment when the RNA gets cut in half, and then you can actually track the two halves of the molecule in real time. And this was surprising because oftentimes people thought that the RNAs were being, might be degraded uh, on the ER, but we could actually see this is going on everywhere inside the cell. And so these tools allow us to sort of address some of these questions that we could really only imagine how they actually worked and so now I think it's exciting because we can try to image these processes in live cells. Sounds very informative. Thank you so much, Jeff Chow. Now we'll head back to the exhibit hall to see what's happening at the Lumix booth. Today we're showing a couple different examples of ways to use the instrument. One of them looking at uh, Cas9 binding, both on and off target Cas9 binding, which is really relevant in the sort of therapeutic application of the technology. And then we're also looking at biomolecular condensates, which for the people that are attending here, I'm sure they're aware how hot of a topic that is. Uh, for the technology itself, uh, I guess what really is nice to know is that it's a really easy turnkey instrument. Many of the biophysicists here may be familiar with optical tweezers, which is sort of the technology that it's built upon. Uh, but in the end, this is a much simpler uh, to use technology compared to the traditional ways that were very like home-built, kind of exclusive to physics labs in the past. We combine a few technologies, optical tweezers, and different types of imaging, like confocal or turf, to basically be able to see molecular interactions at the single molecule level and interact with your samples, applying forces, and visualizing these molecules down to like a single molecule level. Well, BPS is really like the audience that I think is uh, uh, maybe most familiar with the type of things that we do. And for us, this is really like our community. 
many of our customers are here, but then also there's so many people here that you know may not be aware of us yet, but really have great application for what we do. Um, there's a lot of people here looking at uh, you know how forces play a role in biology and how sort of the underlying fundamental physics of how uh, molecular interactions work and how processes work in a cell. And our technology is really good to understand, or really ideal to understand these mechanisms at their most fundamental level. What we're working on nowadays is making the rest of the ecosystem really easy to use for all scientists. Um, last year we talked a lot and we released uh, sort of a biochemistry platform where we provide a lot of samples uh, and a lot of solutions to get your experiments on the C-Track. This year we're releasing uh, Lakeview, which is our new data analysis software, which what this allows is you no longer have to have scripting experience or you know, know how to do programming to pull uh, the parameters out of the data that you're interested in. Now you can take the raw data from the C-Trap, just drop it in a software and get kinetics values, get diffusion values, get all these things for the molecules that you're interested in. And actually at the booth here, we're demoing that where you can you know, do an experiment here at the booth and get real value, publishable values out of your data within just a few minutes. And that is a wrap for this episode of BPS TV, but we still have one more episode in store before we close out for this year. You can keep watching BPS TV around the convention center, on the BPS website, in your hotel room, and on YouTube and Twitter. In our final episode for this meeting, we'll talk to Nobel Prize winner Ardem Petipudian about his work in touch and pain. Plus, we'll hear from meeting chair Elizabeth Vila about what to look forward to at next year's meeting. I'm Lamore Abrams. I'll see you then.